God, I am reminded of your goodness tonight to us. Not based on anything that we have done so that you are just kind of returning the favor. It is... um, We love because you first loved us. You took the first step. I thank you for that. God, as we have sung praises to you tonight and lifted up praise to you, I, I, I hope that it has been a sweet sound to you. Pray that our hearts were clean and where they were not, forgive us, Father. God, bring us now to this place of, of where it's time to open your word. Um, help us forget all the distractions, all of the difficult things that are going on in life, maybe recently. Maybe today, maybe even a few minutes before we came in here. Clear our minds, clear our hearts that we might hear from you tonight, Father. In your Son's name we pray, for his sake. Amen. Amen. Hey, how about we give them a hand? Not sure about you, but I feel like I should have paid to come in here. I I don't know. Also makes me wish I would have paid more attention to my parents when they told me to learn an instrument growing up. (laughs) That was very good. Thank you all for leading us to the throne in such a magnificent way. If you'll turn to 2 Corinthians in the first chapter, that's where we'll get to here in a minute. Um, There are... Let me just get this out there uh, before I start. I have this weird, bizarre feeling that I have preached from this passage very recently in this service. But I've gone through, I keep all of my sermons, I've gone through the files and I can't find it, so you're going to have to let me know if I've preached this recently, okay? All right, hopefully not, but it'll definitely be a different type of uh, message if it is a repeat, a recent repeat, and God will use it, amen? All right, very good. So we'll get to the text here in a minute, but first let me, let me talk about, uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight is a, is a, is a, uh, a right way to view suffering, okay, from, from Paul. Uh, recently we've talked about suffering in our, in our uh, uh, study of James. He talked a lot about that, but Paul's a different guy and he's got to get a different take on it. Um, it's not that one of them was right and one of them was wrong. They're both right and they both have different perspectives. So we're going to check that out tonight. Because I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there's a lot of suffering going on in the world. Did you know that? Uh, before I get into my sermon, let me remind you, uh, sorry, I've forgotten that we have a business meeting after this. All right, so if you're a member, stay for that. I didn't want to forget to uh, tell you that. So, uh, but there's a lot of suffering going on in the world today, whether it be uh, the, 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 the terrorist attacks in Paris recently, or ISIS, which is another terrorist group terrorizing the Middle East, or Boko Haram terrorizing Nigeria, whether it be just simple, I say simple, uh, it seems simple in comparison to things like that, but it is just as heartbreaking, it has just as many bad effects, things like divorce and parents separating and children growing up without a mother or children growing up without a father, and all the way down, all the way on the other spectrum uh, to the evils of abortion that we have experienced in our country for the past 40-some years. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday, where we march all around the country. Marches have been organized for the past 40 years. They have grown in number, all right? Um, Sanctity of Life Sunday is a Sunday where people who are for... um, the innocent lives of little kids not being taken march uh, in, in large cities, maybe even small communities around our country. But the whole point is this, is that suffering is going on in our world, and there's a number of ways to look at suffering. We're not going to cover them all. One of the main ones, really just in the Western world, this doesn't go on in the Eastern world, so don't be fooled into thinking that this is a worldwide phenomenon. Okay? This is a Western kind of intellectual response to suffering, and it is this. Well, there can't be any God. There's just no God. If this is, if this is his plan, if this was his goal to, for all this suffering to occur, then there can't be a God. You see, but that answer is too simplistic. To look out on the world and see all the suffering and to conclude that there is no God is too simplistic. Here's why. There is a God. We're not going to deal with that. That, that. You know, We need to defend that if we're just going to say that, but that's not my point. The point is this. That God exists, but he never said that the goal of life is to be without suffering. You following that? So it's too simplistic to say, well, he can't exist. We we should respond. He never said there wouldn't be any suffering. That can't disprove his existence. That was never his goal for you. That might be a newsflash to you. Right? 
Maybe you grew up in a Christian home where you thought that it was some sort of promise from God that your family would never suffer at all. It's nowhere in the Bible. In fact, the opposite is true. God expects us to suffer like His Son Jesus did. That's one response, but the answer is too simplistic. It's too simplistic to say that there is no God just because there's suffering, because He never promised there wouldn't be. Another one, and this is, this is gaining steam, all right, in the Western culture uh, as well, and, and maybe you don't know about it, but it is, it is uh, spreading across Europe, and it is in some ways already here in America, and it is this. Let's just do away with suffering now. Let's try everything we can to do away with suffering. And here's the thing. That's a noble task. It's a noble thing to want to, want to get um, rid of suffering. The problem is the timeline. You see, because God said that he would get rid of suffering, but that's only after Jesus comes back and we are in heaven. His children are with him in heaven. You following that? There will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears. He'll wipe away all the tears. There will be none of that, but he never said that it'll cease this side of heaven. And so it sounds like a noble thing to say, let's, let's give all of our power, all of our energy, all of our money, all of our you know, thinking process to let's eliminate evil and suffering this side of death, basically. Here's the problem with that. There's a lot of problematic um, results that stem from that. You see, in Europe, what's going on in a, in a number of nations now is certain people aren't happy with life. Or maybe they're depressed, or maybe they are ill and they don't want to keep living. There are assisted suicide clinics all over Europe now. If you want to not suffer anymore, we will help you in that. That's a horrible, horrible thing. You see, the, the idea that we should end suffering has all sorts of problems, all sorts of negative results, and it stems from this. You are not God. It is not upon you. No one, God nowhere in Scripture has tasked you with ending suffering this side of heaven. Abortion is the same, uh, falls under this same logic. This baby is going to be born, and he will never do anything more than be a vegetable. Maybe he will never speak, he will never hear, he will never walk, he will never learn. You will take care of him his whole life. He will never grow past that. Let us end his suffering. You are not God. Who am I to say whether that baby will have a good life or not? It sounds like a noble thing to deal with suffering by trying to end it all. But you can't end it all. You're taking on a task that is absolutely impossible for all of humanity, even combined. So some people react, they say, there's just no God. All this suffering, there's no God. Other people react, well, let's try to end the suffering right now. But see, there's this other way, and I, I, I told you there's not, you know, we're not going to cover all the ways. There's this other way. It's kind of this weird, religious, pious way to deal with it. It's really annoying. And it's the one that Paul was dealing with in, with the Corinthians here. See, there were some opponents that were in, have infiltrated the Corinthian people. And if you don't know the Corinthians, the church at Corinth, they're not really kind of upstanding model church. You, are you following me? So don't really go to the Corinthians for uh, guidance. Um, but... Uh, there's people who have infiltrated them, and they were all too happy to, to hear them out, you know, and to actually implement some of the things that they were saying. But these opponents of Paul were actually saying that there's no way he could be apostle. He suffers too much. So the implication is, the more you suffer, the farther away you are from God, or the less faith you have. The reverse side of that is, if you don't suffer much, then you must be close to God. Did you follow their line of reasoning? He can't be apostle. He suffers too much. That's so pious and ridiculous. Did you know that the opposite is actually true? The more you suffer and you keep your faith in God in that suffering, the closer you are to Him. Anyone who's been through anything difficult in their life will completely agree with me. I don't even have to meet them. I know that they will agree with that. If they have kept their faith in God through that difficult time, they are closer to Him now than the day before tragedy struck them. But see, these guys, they're dealing with suffering in a different way. You see, it seems like a pious thing to say, like, well, we've got to have more faith and God will, won't cause as much suffering to us. But here's what they've done. On top of all the suffering that Paul has gone through, they have heaped more angst upon him by saying that he's not very close to God. He can't be an apostle. That's not a very Christian thing to do. So what Paul's going to do tonight is he is going to answer all of these questions or all of these responses to suffering with his way. And it's not his way, it's God's way. 
So let us look at how he answers them. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3, we'll read through 7 and then we'll walk back and, and unpack it all as we go. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, see, so that's the idea is to share in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. So the way he starts out 2 Corinthians is a very interesting way. See, in in most all of his letters, he starts off with either... um, uh, a prayer or a thanksgiving or even a prayer of thanksgiving. But in 2 Corinthians, he starts with the blessing of God. He begins this letter with the blessing of God. We must ask why. He does it for the same reason he does everything else, it seems. Paul's like varsity Christian. Here's why he does it. To deflect the glory back to God. You see, these, these opponents of his have come in and and they are taking away these people's listening time with all this nonsense about how Paul's not an apostle. Now Paul is very serious about defending his apostleship. It's almost kind of weird to the Western uh, mind to to, to read his letters and how much he defends himself. He's like, gosh, why is this guy always justifying himself, right? At least that's what I think sometimes when I read Paul. But it's very common back in the day. You see, he needed them to know that he was an apostle because if he wasn't, then they don't need to be listening to him. You see, the, the, the office of apostle is gone now. It's gone. But it was very, very important during that day because the apostles are who Jesus left his work with. Paul needed the people to know that he was an apostle. But right now, he's not concerned with getting an argument in defending his apostleship. He'll do that later. What he wants to do first is deflect the glory back to God. I don't want to talk about whether I'm an apostle or not. I want to talk about God who blesses me through all of my affliction. That's what I want to talk about, he says. So he redirects their attention back to God. Look at 3 and 4 again. Hopefully you saw it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. By now... Paul has a lengthy relationship with the people at Corinth, okay? He he planted the church at Corinth, and he's actually written three letters already to them, only one of which survived, 1 Corinthians. But he wrote one before that, then he wrote 1 Corinthians, then he wrote another one, and then he wrote this one. He's got a lengthy relationship with them, and it's not a very smooth relationship. It's kind of rocky, actually, which is why he's having to write so much. He write four letters to the people. Seems like they kind of had hard heads. Church people don't change, Amen. But Paul here, the reason he's upset with the Corinthians is because they have kind of just blindly accepted this, uh, this, these, this opponent's views. These opponent's views. So they're questioning Paul. Like, well, I don't know really. I don't really know if he's an apostle. But he destroys these people's argument by saying, actually, God comforts me in all my affliction so that I can comfort others who are afflicted. Not only is, is that complete nonsense that the more I suffer, the farther I, I am from God and it somehow discredits my apostleship, but actually, I am comforted all the more in my affliction by God so that I might comfort others. Two things he's doing here. Instead of taking the bait and getting into an argument about how he really is an apostle, he just says, no, my affliction is just an opportunity for me to rely on God more. Is that how you view your affliction? That's what made Paul so infuriating to everyone who didn't like him, right? Paul would say things like, for me to die or for me to live is, uh, for me to die is, what is it? What does he say? <laughs> live as Christ, die as gain. Good grief. I haven't been to seminary. I'm working on it right now. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I know it's Philippians 121 though. Um, that's so infuriating, Right? 
if, you, if I live, I'll just share Jesus more. If I die, I'm just going to go be with him. I don't want to talk about whether I'm an apostle right now or not. All I know is that when I'm afflicted, I get comforted by God more. Paul infuriated people, and that's why he was able to pin the famous verse from this same book, right? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, talking about Jesus talking to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my, in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So we are to do the same. Our suffering is a chance to rely on God more. Are you taking advantage of that? Or have you gone down the road of the world and, and picked any of those other options to deal with suffering? You see, suffering, affliction, is an opportunity to rely on God more. Because did, did you hear what it says? He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction. He doesn't pick and choose. He'll just comfort you in the big stuff. He will comfort you in every single affliction you go through. I don't care how small you think it is. People, people who say that, well, you know, you really shouldn't get hung up on the small stuff like a flat tire on the side of the road. You know what? You can go be holy somewhere else. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes you're going down the road and your, fly, your, your tire's flat and your whole, your whole day's wrecked because you were going somewhere big. You were going somewhere important. And it's messed you up. It doesn't mean you're unholy. It just means you're human. God doesn't care how small the affliction is. He comforts you in it, if you'll have him. The second thing he's doing here in these verses is um, that our affliction brings on God's comfort, which allows us to comfort others. There's always a point. Look at verse 4 again. Who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You are comforted by God in your suffering, in your affliction, so that you might comfort others. Don't hog all the comfort. It's a, it sounds funny to say, right? It's a devastating result when you do it. Because there's people out there going through a lot of stuff. And you've been through stuff, and we know that. God knows that. But don't hog all the comfort. Comfort someone else. With the comfort that God gave you. Someone is out there right now needing your comfort. Needing the comfort of God rather. And God has chosen you to be the instrument through which that person is comforted. Don't let people suffer for longer than they have to. But here's the tricky part. You can't comfort others unless you've experienced that comfort first. You say, well, wait a second, you know, I'm a child of God and it says he comforts me in all my afflictions. Yes, he is ready and willing all the time, but are you ready and willing to accept his comfort? Let me put it another way that might strike closer to home. Are you ready and willing to accept God's grace for you? See, when you really think about it and when you really do some meditating and reflecting in your life, a lot of the angst and the turmoil and the anger maybe, all the sin in our lives comes from some level of not being able to accept God's grace for us. And then another kind of side effect of that is that you can't show grace to yourself. So there's no grace for anyone else. You can't allow God to comfort you, so you do little comforting to others. Have you allowed God to comfort you? It's harder than it sounds. Allowing God to comfort us means allowing ourselves to accept His grace. It is absolutely necessary if you're going to comfort others, to experience that comfort yourself. You see, because you cannot relay something to someone that you've never experienced yourself. You can't teach someone something that you've never learned. You can't relay a feeling of comfort that you've never experienced from God. You have been comforted to comfort. Don't hog all the comfort. Look at verses 5 through 7 again. We'll be done shortly. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, 
so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. See, the, the sense from verse 5 is that there, there's going to be sufferings. Just, you know, there's going, they are going to be there for you. They're going to be there for me. But the comforting thing is that, you know, no pun intended, is that there will be comfort that accompanies those sufferings. And then in verse 6, Paul gives another one of his kind of just varsity Christian type sentences. If, if I'm afflicted, it's for your comfort. If I'm comforted, it's for your comfort. He never says, if I'm afflicted, it's for my own comfort so I can, you know, feel comforted by God. Or if I'm comforted, it's so that I can enjoy God's grace for me. Although those things are true. But he realizes that it never ends on me. It always must be transferred to someone else to be complete. If I'm afflicted, it's for your comfort. Somehow, some way. I'm going to learn through it. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to show you the way through it. And if I'm comforted, it is for your comfort. This is an amazing thing. No matter what happens to me, he is saying. He's saying we. I'm, I'm guessing he's throwing Timothy in there as well because Timothy um, took him the letter. No matter what happens to us, he says, the end result, your comfort. Is this your view of the Christian life? Is this the Christian life that you are living? Right? Or as Dan has been talking about in this series on, this month on prayer, are all your prayers about you? Is there any prayer for others going on, that intercessory prayer we talked about this morning? This is a great place to get to in the Christian life. That no matter what happens to me, it's for you guys. There's no time for a pity party, Jordan. There's people out there who need help. Not because you're the Savior. Because God wants to use you. And he says the same thing to you. There's no time for a pity party. People need you. They don't need you in the sense that you can save them from their sins. They need you in the sense that you're a walking testimony that someone can be saved from their sins. That grace is real. The comfort and affliction is real. Comfort in difficult times is real. Is this your life? How devoted are we to those around us? Rest assured, to the level that you are devoted to yourself, you are equally not devoted to others. I want to end by just talking about the word comfort just for a bit. Okay? literally means to come alongside and help. It's used 10 times in verses 1 through 11, unless I missed one or counted one twice. I think it's 10 times. Okay? Come alongside and help. It's actually the name that Jesus gives to the Holy Spirit, remember? His high priestly prayer? Right? The comforter. Actually, right before his high priestly prayer, sorry, in John 14 through 16. He's the comforter the Holy Spirit is. Comforting others, being comforted by God and comforting others is a key part of the mission of God for His people. But suffering is also a key part of God's mission for us. You see, without suffering, comfort just becomes another idol. Are you hearing me? It's kind of like a painkiller. It's really good and helpful when you've got pain. It's really destructive when you don't. So we're not saying just seek comfort. At all costs, because God wants to comfort everyone, and you should comfort everyone no matter what. There's got to be wisdom in this. Right? Comfort is only possible, only necessary, because of suffering. We must be wise when we are dealing out comfort. Comfort is a very, 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 very powerful thing. It's a ministry of presence. I've, I've found myself comforting a number of my brothers and sisters in Christ recently. I don't know how well. 
It's not about how well. It's about being obedient to whatever God wants you to do. He's called us to comfort others. That's why comfort has been on my mind. So two things I want to ask tonight as, as we end, and we've kind of briefly talked about them as we've gone. Um, someone, somebody from the band is going to come up here and lead us um, in, a, in, a, in a song. But two things I want to ask you is, one, are you struggling with being comforted by God? Okay. And maybe not just in some suffering that is uh, no part, you know, no, no result of sin in your life. Right? You see, there's certain types of suffering that come because of sin. Maybe you are suffering in life because of sin. You see, God's comfort for you and God's grace for you is real even in those moments. Are you struggling with accepting the comfort and the grace of God? Until you're okay with that. Until you're okay with not having to earn a thing from Him. Okay? You're not going to be able to comfort anyone else very well. So are you having trouble being comforted by God tonight? I want us here in a minute to lay it all down. I want you to lay it down. And let me give you a news flash. It might not be the last time you lay it down. Could be. Praise be to God. But it might not be. We've got to learn how to repeatedly lay stuff down at the feet of Jesus. Not just when we're in church. Every morning when we get up, every night before we go to bed. All time, the Christian life is a life of repentance. But then, the second question is, and it's, I guess it's already answered if you are not being able to comfort others, but the second question is, are you comforting others? Are you giving them what you've got? I'm not talking about just like the intelligence that, that, that God gave you or the wisdom or, or anything like that. Those are important things. Comfort. Coming alongside to help. Are you giving that to others? Are you giving Jesus to others? The message, the hope of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news. Are you comforting others with that? Or are you only seeking comfort for yourself? Don't hog all the comfort. Spread it. Share it. Watch God move. Let's pray. God, our heart's desire is to be comforted by you, and there's no doubt in my mind that every child of yours has been comforted many, 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 many times in our lives. But we are, we have spiritual amnesia most of the time. We forget. We forget all the things that you have done for us, like the Israelites forgot all the ways that you came to their rescue in the wilderness. But God, tonight we want to once again, just hand over whatever is standing between us and accepting your comfort and your grace. You're coming alongside to help us. We want to lay it down. Give us the courage and the power to do so. And God, if we have been selfish with your comfort, forgive us. Help us to share it more with others, as Paul did. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with us. Um, we're going to sing one more song. The altar is open here uh, for you if you'd like to come lay whatever it is you need to lay down. I'll be down here at the front. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins, you can do that tonight. This is what this is about. Salvation is the greatest comfort you can ever experience. I'll be down here if you want to talk about that. Don't forget that afterwards we have a business meeting. God bless.